Tonight, what we're going to do is I'm going to share the secret sauce. And, um, you know, the secret sauce is that, and this is a sad thing, but your tomatoes will get disease. And the secret sauce is, is how do you um, help those tomato plants get disease later in the season, as opposed to earlier in the season, um, so that you can um, get the most tomatoes off of those plants. And so that's what we're going to, going to focus on. Um, so uh, organic is the way that I grow. Um, organic means that we're not using synthetic pesticides, fertilizers, sewage sludge, um, modified, genetically modified um, things. Or, and, and so these are the types of food that we are pulling out of our community garden. These are all pictures from our community garden and people who are um, working in the garden. And so you can see that organic doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you know, vegetables that don't look pretty because they absolutely do. And, and so um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share with you how we're doing that. And I'm gonna start with just right at the very beginning. So you're already past this point, but I thought I would share this information about um, choosing a spot and preparing a soil so that you can think about this for the upcoming year. So the first thing is that I'm a heavy believer in crop rotation. And crop rotation means that I'm not going to grow the same plants in the same bed, in the same spot in the same bed, year after year after year. And that's partially why I have a, um, and some additional beds that I'm using at the farm because as we've been on our property for 20 years where I put my first garden bed um, is now mostly shade. And so as things over 20 years, the trees obviously have grown immensely and um, we are fairly heavily wooded and so I just was not getting enough sun. So um, I needed to crop rotate and also use some additional beds in full sun in order to get there. The second thing is that I think people um, work way too hard in preparing their beds. Um, I use a fork because it's really important to get air into the soil. So um, the plants need, they need the soil, they need water, and they need air in the soil. And so just by lifting, I'm not hoisting a shovel and hurting my back. In addition, you know, the shovel has that flat surface and it's really kind of like compacting things. So once your soil gets into and you added enough um, organic matter to it, um, it's easier to just use a fork and then I have a religious rule, which that is nobody walks in my garden beds because that just compacts things and, um, and I don't want that compacting. Um, so the other thing is compost, adding um, compost to the soil and in fall, adding organic matter like leaves. So the one thing that, um, and, and these are things that I learned along the way that I'll share with you, so you want to put three to four inches of compost over the top of the garden. I, I just take a hand trowel and just work that into the top two to three inches of the soil. And then when I'm planting tomatoes, um, I just take another big handful and throw it into the hole that I'm planting the tomato in. And so um, that is how I add compost um, when I'm putting tomatoes in. So as I said, full sun is best, but some shade can be tolerated. Um, I have some beds, those ones that have got trees over them now, um, that have got partial shade during the day, but my tomatoes are still doing fine. 
I'm probably not going to have as many tomatoes. So I put my cherry tomatoes in there. Um, and, you know, it, like I said, full sun is best, but some, some shade can be tolerated, so a small amount. And then it's really important to keep the area around the plants weeded. Um, and then if you are starting a new bed, I just want to say that cardboard is your friend. So if you haven't used cardboard, if you are starting a new bed to put down to um, take the weeds away um, and just cover the weeds, and then you can throw everything on top and um, throw your soil in after that, or put your soil on top of that, or if you're deep mulching and creating layers, you can do that as well. Um, but it keeps the weeds down. And literally what I do is, no, I don't do this. My husband does this. He puts card down, cardboard down in the aisles of the gardens so that I don't have to be weeding. And as a permaculturist, I am always looking for the easiest way to do things and with the least amount of time. So it's really easy to start tomatoes from seed. Um, in fact, with our community garden, that is the thing that I give tomatoes are the, the seeds that I give our most novice um, seed starters to start and then they bring them back to me after about four or five weeks and then I finish them off because they are that easy to start. And so if you're going to be starting um, tomatoes from seed, you would start them seven to eight weeks before Memorial Day because Memorial Day is, is the target date for putting in um, crops that cannot stand a freeze. Now, I have to admit, I've put tomato plants in before Memorial Day, but what I do is I check my calendar, and if I'm gonna put them in the weekend before, I will look out um, on my, um, my NOAA weather app and look and see to ensure that we're not gonna get any frosts. Um, you know, and you, and you do these things by learning. I didn't do that one year, many years ago. All of my tomato plants died. They looked like they died. Actually, the roots were still going. Um, and so I had to like speed start a whole bunch of tomatoes. The silly thing was, is that even the ones that had looked like they had died, they started growing up again from the roots. And so then I had like all kinds of tomatoes, more than I could use. So um, when you're choosing plants, let's say you're choosing plants from a store or from a plant sale, you want to choose plants for health and good root structure. So you don't need a plant that's two feet tall or a foot tall. Um, what you need is a plant that has a good stocky stem and is healthy, doesn't have any yellowing on it or browning on it. Um, and looks like a good, healthy plant. That tomato plant will, no matter, um, you know, if it's this big or if it's this big, is it's going to grow. And you're not gonna be able to tell the difference um, between a, um, you know, a six inch plant or an eight inch plant or a four inch plant or a, a, an eight inch plant in a, in a month or two. So choose something that's healthy and has a good stocky stem and a good root system. Um, spacing your plants two to three feet apart. Uh, I also believe in not putting all my tomato plants in um, just one bed. Well, obviously I can't do that because I'm growing too many tomato plants. But um, disease, this is a, so this is the hint, it's like warding off disease. If I have every tomato plant that I have planted in the same spot, um, most of the diseases are fungal diseases. And so um, the, the wind and touching is going to cause that disease to be transferred from plant to plant to plant to plant. So literally what I do is I will put some of my plants in one garden, I will put other plants in a totally different garden, other plants in a totally different garden. And because I've got you know, and so for you, because um, maybe you don't have multiple garden beds in your, on your property, it's, you know, you can stick a tomato plant in one corner and a tomato plant in the different corner of your garden um, so that they're not sitting right next to each other in order to kind of reduce the amount of disease that's transferred between them. 
Now I will say one of the, the UW documents that I looked at said space your plants five feet apart. Who has that kind of space? I don't know. So two to three feet apart, another document said, I place my plants two to three feet apart. Um, and then make a watering plan. In other words, know how you're, have, a, have it in your head how you're going to water those plants um, before you put them in the ground so that you're not spending all kinds of tons of time trying to keep these plants watered. But definitely immediately mulch the plants after planting. And you're gonna see this in these pictures that are coming up that mulch um, is under all of these plants and that you need to mulch immediately after putting the plants in the ground. And, and we're gonna talk about disease a lot. And I saw that right when we started, my, my plants have got yellowing leaves. This is the disease that many of them have. Um, and so we're, we're going to address that in this. Now, I call these nice friends. I love putting marigolds in between my tomatoes on the edges because when, then when I look out into my garden and I don't have red ripe tomatoes yet, I see these beautiful little flowers and they look like I have tomatoes. Okay, so choosing plants. So there's open pollinated, you've probably heard the words heirloom and hybrid. So um, all of the tomato plant flowers, like you see in, the, in this um, here, the flowers are self um, pollinating. So in other words, they have both the male and the female parts on the same blossom. Now, what some people do is they will go out and they will shake their plants in order to you know, try and increase pollination. Does that work? I don't know. I think um, when I'm in there pruning and I'm, you know, checking the plants um, or the wind is, is going to do that, if you want to shake your plants, go for it. Um, heirloom varieties are plant varieties that have, they're generally, I don't know of any heirlooms that are not open pollinated. They're open pollinated, which means that they, the the children are the same as the parents, okay? So you can save seed from an open pollinated plant and then plant that seed the following year and you will get a plant that gives you tomatoes like the parent plant, as opposed to a hybrid, which is a controlled method of pollination, which crosses two different um, varieties. And so my example here is Big Beef. And Big Beef Hybrid, we sell a lot of these at our plant sale when we grow and sell these, because you can see they're, they're like a market tomato. They're a round tomato. Big Beef puts on a heck of a lot of tomatoes. And so they're great for our community garden because we're um, sending our food off to the food pantry and people are getting tomatoes like they see in the store. And so there are people who just want a tomato that it's round, it slices, it fits on my burger, you know, that kind of thing. Whereas heirloom tomatoes um, often don't look like this. They, they often look um, uh, unique, we'll put it that way. Um, I, I wish I knew what kind of tomato this was. We, we didn't check it, but this is a tomato from our community garden. Um, it was huge. Okay, so you can get a really wide, varain, wide variety and range of tomatoes, you know, whether they're heirlooms, they're open pollinated or hybrids. Um, and this, and what's fun about doing open pollinated and heirlooms is that I do a lot of seed exchange with friends. And so this is just a list right here of all the varieties that I've gotten in, in exchange from friends. That, have, that are um, tomatoes that I can continuously grow today. So another aspect of tomato plants is determinate versus indeterminate. And you'll see this in your seed catalogs. So an example of a determinate plant, so I'm showing you Princip Principe Borghese cherry. And this, this cherry is one that I put on my dehydrator because it's a perfect cherry and it's wonderful for um, as, a, as a dried or sun-dried tomato. Um, and then I use these all winter long. So it's determinant. So this plant never gets above four feet. So right now it's four feet in holding in, in my garden. Um, so it's a great for patio and pots and small spaces. 
um, because it doesn't get very big. And so when you see a patio tomato, generally it's gonna be a determinant um, tomato plant. Like we, we sell champion two bush. So it's, and then there's also a champion two, which is a indeterminate. And so this right here, Casino Chips Cherry, um, this is six feet right now and growing. So it needs space and it needs trellising versus just this tomato, um, the determinant tomato. I can just put a small tomato ring on that and I'm done, okay? So I have to think about trellising with this and you might be able to see back here, there is a cattle fence that is back behind on these T-posts. And then, so what I'm using is I'm using a tomato ring that is five loops or five circles high. So it's an extra high tomato ring. And then I've got um, cattle fencing behind it. So what I'm doing is once it gets beyond and up beyond that um, top ring, is then I am tying off to the cattle fencing. So that's one method that, that I use at home and we also use at the community garden. Okay, so determinant and indeterminate. So it doesn't necessarily mean when you're working with heirlooms and with open pollinated as people are um, you know, collecting seed. So this is Wisconsin 55. It's a great tomato. It's an heirloom. It was bred by the University of Wisconsin in the 40s. And it's an indeterminate tomato. And look at these little dudes. They're three feet and holding. And we're looking at these and every single one of them in our community garden is about three feet tall. Um, now, these guys have very few leaves on, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, so they had a lot of disease, so we were pulling the disease off of them. And so they're at risk of not even photosynthesizing at this point in time. But, you know, the goal is to try and get these tomatoes to ripen and get them off. And they certainly have, like, produced their share for their size. So, um, so sometimes um, in open pollination, if something crosses or um, something's being seed saved and um, it happened to be from an extraordinary small tomato plant, um, you know, you can have an alteration in what those plants look like. So, um, you know, everything is unique, nothing is perfect. Uh, and that's part of the fun of it. Okay, so another thing that you will see is tobacco leaf and tomato leaf um, types of plants. So tomatoes, potatoes, tobacco, eggplant, pepper, they're all from the Solanaceae family or the nightshade family. And so this is uh, actually mimics more like a tobacco leaf as in tobacco. And this is a tomato leaf. Now, is there really any different in the plants? No, um, that's just part of their genetics. I have a friend who just loves to grow everything tobacco leaf because she likes the look of the tobacco leaf. And so she has a preference to tomatoes in that, um, in that vein. So um, that's cool, but um, you know, it doesn't matter either way. Uh, the one thing that I do wanna point out is that all of these types of plants are in this nightshade family. And so, you know, what you're really supposed to do is you're really supposed to, in your rotation, not just rotate um, tomato plants out of a bed and you then into a different bed, is that ideally, and I find this extremely high, hard, which is another reason I'm growing some plants out at the farm, is to keep a rotation um, where, you know, now I'm forced to not only put my tomato plants for next year in a bed that didn't have tomato plants, but it also didn't have potatoes, um, eggplant, or peppers. And I heavily grow all of those things. So that, that always is a difficulty for me. And so my rotation probably is more two years than it is three years. Okay, so um, trellising and mulching and pruning. I'm gonna get into that um, now. So a tomato ring, as, you, as I pointed out before, may not be enough if you have a very vining plant um, and you have a lot of vines on. 
But one thing that you really want to do is the very first thing, and this is to ward off disease when you plant your plant, is to put mulch down. Now, different people use different things. I use straw because it's a simple thing. Um, other people, can, you can use newspaper shreddings. I wouldn't just put down newspaper flat because then the water is, it's going to create a water barrier um, unless you've got drip running underneath the newspaper, have drip lines running underneath the newspaper. Um, so I use straw because it's permeable um, and it, what you're trying to do is you're trying to separate the plant from the soil, the plant leaves from the soil, because most of the diseases that the tomato plant picks up is because rain is going down, it hits the soil, it bounces up, and these fungus, um, fungi, the fungal, fungal diseases are, are, are coming out of the, they're coming from the soil, okay? So here are things you don't wanna do. You don't want to prune off the dead leaves and throw them under the plant because you're just exacerbating the problem. So what you want to do is if when you take these yellow leaves off and, and we're going to get into what these look like, etc., you want to take them all out of the garden and you want to take them as far away from your tomato plants as possible. Um, and so I, I take them way far away and you do not want to compost them because you don't want to continue to put these, um, these diseases into your compost and then back into your soil. So you take these and, and, you, and you get rid of them. Um, the other thing that you want to do is you, it, and again, you're creating this distance between the soil and the tomato plant. And so as this plant is growing, I'm continuing to prune up. And you know, my, my plants, and you'll see this, they're, they're 10, I'm gonna say that's like eight to 12 inches from the, the ground, okay? And that's where my first um, branches are. And so what I'm doing as this plant is growing is I'm pruning out what's called suckers. And I'm, I'm gonna show you this little video. Um, so a sucker is something that is in the, the crotch of this leaf and stem that's going to grow into another vine. So it's another vine like this. And so that way I'm creating this, um, you know, leg here that its skirt is, you know, at the knee or above the knee, whatever. Um, so I, I had a situation one year, I put my tomato plants into one bed and then I didn't get them mulched right away. And I walked away, there was a huge rainstorm. That bed was, um, showed signs of decimation and disease like crazy. And so, um, you know, it's like, oh, learn that, won't do that again. Um, although I have. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to show you this video about pruning and what suckers are. Here I'm out in my garden and I want to show you what a sucker is and what will grow into a vine extending off of this plant. So if you see right here, this is a leaf. Here's the trunk of the tomato plant and right here there is another leaf growing out of the crotch of this leaf and trunk of the plant. So this right here is the sucker. This will grow into another vine or stem like this one that goes all the way up and will become another branch of the tomato plant. So if I don't want this to be a whole nother vine going up on the plant, I can just take and pinch this off, which I've just done, because this is kind of low on the plant and it's really humid this year. So I don't want a lot of vining going on and adding to the number of branches I already have on this plant, especially down this low. Okay, so, um, you know, when I first started gardening, people would talk about suckers and I'd go out and I'd stare at my plant and I'd go, I don't get it. But, you know, this, that, what I just pinched off there, it's 
you know, it starts out as a little leaflet. And so when it's a smaller plant, it's just pinching out those little leaflets that, that, that are cropping up in order to um, take off the bottom structure. And um, yeah, it's, it's that simple. So here's a bed that is mulched and pruned. So you can see that I've got um, distance between the ground and the plants. And the reason is, is so that I have plenty of air circulation so that those leaves are drying out and they're not sitting wet. Is it wet, humid, hot, or wet, humid, cold invites fungal diseases. And that's where you start getting the yellowing and the falling off of the leaves. And isn't that marigold beautiful there? All right. So trellis and staking. There are as many options as there are people for trellising. Seriously, it's like, what have you got in your garage um, and or what works for the beds that you have? So, um, so here I've got tomatoes that were started with rings. They have tall rings. I know that all of these are indeterminate plants and they grow pretty large. And so, um, We've moved the P trellis um, elements, so a couple of T posts and a couple of posts here across the top. So what I'm doing is as these vines get long and they get heavy because they've got these tomatoes on them, is that I will take and I will um, wrap twine around them and I'll give you a little demo of this when we get to the end of the presentation. And then I will just do a slip knot up to this to hold the vines up. And I tend to just wrap the vine itself a couple of times um, and then tie it up. And then as the vines grow, I can just pull that slip knot out. If I need to wind it a little bit further because something's taken off in another direction, I can do that. So in this case, now my red line right here is actually a vine of an opalca tomato. It's a Roma tomato. And um, initially, I wasn't like really paying attention to this bed. It's kind of, you know, this were kind of a last minute thought. And they got, this vine got caught up in my sunchokes over here, which is not e hard to do because those sunchokes are always trying to get everywhere. Um, and so I pulled it out of there and it literally is just one vine going up. And so I took it and you can see here's the string that's tying it up. And I've just pulled it out into the sun and kind of totally eliminated it, the use of the cage here. Um, but opelka tends to do that. It tends to just, you know, kind of be like more of a singular vine going up and doesn't sprout um, offshoots a lot. All right, so as I was going through the Master Gardener um, documents, I just loved this phrase. It said, um, in the tomato, homegrown tomatoes for Wisconsin, under the watering section, which was very small, it said plants may require occasional watering. And I was like, God, that's great. Because what do we, what is everybody trying to sell us? It's like wall of water. You need to water your tomato plants like a gallon every other day and blah, blah, blah. All of this stuff about, you know, enormous amounts of water on your plants. And you know what, I used to think that. I used to stand out there and literally, um, you know, with the hose and water my tomato, hand water my tomato plants. And as I got more and more tomato plants, it's like, I can't do this anymore. Um, and the reality is, is I'm, I'm just gonna give you between the three locations that, I, that we have tomato plants in right now. So um, at, my garden, I'm using a drip system that right now is it's kind of old and so it's really not dripping to the amount that it should, but technically it's supposed to be dripping a half gallon an hour and probably every tomato plant has got two drippers, so it's probably getting um, a gallon, of, it should be getting a gallon of water um, every other day, okay? So over at the community garden, um, 
the watering system was turned on early on and I just had a conversation with my, with my husband who turned the watering system on and has been monitoring the watering system and just learned today that that thing has been going off daily. And so literally they've been getting like at least a gallon of water every day. And then at the farm, they, those tomato plants at the farm have um, been watered by me maybe twice in the season. And um, I think the last time I watered them, they got um, about a quart of water each. Okay. Now, the plants in, in my um, yard are doing fine. The plants at the, at the farm, they might be just a little bit shorter, but not that much. They're doing great. They also are mulched in really well, okay? The plants at the community garden have got all kinds of disease on them. And so as I was like just putting the finishing touches on this um, presentation and adding the watering part of it, it just went, boy, it just dawned on me as to what might be the problem. Cause we're, you know, everybody's looking at these plants and we're going, why have they got so much disease? I don't have this at home. And I just went and asked my husband and he's got, yeah, I've got it still on every day. And I'm like, well, of course. Um, you know, we're getting, because we're overwatering, the soil is constantly damp, it's creating additional moisture, and we're getting disease on the tomato plants, okay? So all of that stuff that's been said to you about you need to water, 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 what I've learned over the years is I have totally cut back on the amount of water, even just in my, on all plants, of watering all plants, because I can see that it, um, it actually can at, be detrimental in some cases. And, and seriously, if you're putting that much water on, you're just washing out the nutrients in your soil. So um, you really don't need to water. So this is what I do now, is that I have a rain gauge. And so that rain gauge tells me if there's been an inch of rain in a week, I don't worry about watering my garden. I will, I will go and I will be turning off drip systems. Um, and so the, the, there are differences though in soil. So if you've got clay soil versus really loamy soil, what you really need to do is you need to get in there and you need to get your hand underneath that um, mulch layer and check and see what the dampness is of the soil. Um, because you really want to not just, you, you want to deep water, but not water that often, okay? So you want to avoid shallow watering because you want to always build deep roots, right? Because the, the, the better the roots, the better the top of the plant is, the healthier the top of the plant is. Um, so I have become a proponent of less watering because I don't think it's necessary. So I, that's why when I saw this statement, plants may require occasional watering, I was like, yeah, that's, that is a great statement. Um, if you, and from a fertilizing standpoint, um, I generally do not fertilize my tomatoes beyond, um, beyond just using compost, okay? Um, there have been occasions when We've had, as an example, um, we put in uncomposted manure and um, sawdust straw in the fall, and it had not composted in the spring. And then we planted our tomato plants in there, and our tomato plants sat there for weeks and did not grow. So what happens is if you have raw material in your soil, like straw, like sawdust, um, you know, things that are not composted, those items will use the nitrogen from the soil to break down and they will literally starve your plants of nitrogen. So you really need to use well-composted material. 
So what we did that last, that year, is we side dressed with blood meal and we used fish emulsion um, as fertilizer to get those plants going while all of that other material was, was um, still degrading in the soil. So, um, so that was important to use fertilizer at that point in time. So when, when I'm mulching with straw, what I don't wanna do by the end, at the end of the season is just go, oh, okay, I'll just work this straw into my garden soil because it's half deteriorated. It takes a long time for straw to deteriorate. That straw will still be there in spring. Um, so what you wanna do is you want to um, just, you can leave it over the top of the soil if you're not growing anything else in it, but then to pull it off in spring and add compost and to not work it into the soil unless it's so broke down you can't recognize it. Okay, disease. Um, all right, I need to speed this up. Okay, so disease, septoria and early blight is what you're probably seeing right now. So um, the, and, and I'll show you in closer up what those look like. So you can see, I'm just moving my mouse out of the way, so under blights and wilts on this particular um, document, and by the way, all of these documents I'm referring to, they're on our website, um, and they're on the permaculture and gardening page, and if you scroll down, you will see this presentation and the documents that I'm, I'm referencing here. So septoria leaf spot, early blight, these are the things, this is where you're seeing the yellow leaves. So what you wanna do is you want to remove these from the garden, don't compost them, get them out of the garden, far away from your garden, and, um, and you need to keep removing them because what happens is when those leaves touch other leaves, they transfer the disease. So immediately get them out. Um, what you don't want to do is you, you don't want to end up with our poor like Wisconsin 55 where it has like no leaves for photosynthesis. So, you know, be judicious in, in what you're doing. Um, and let the plant, you know, get a balance there, but you, but you need to get those out because they will just continue to work their way up the plant because it's, it's, it will, it's just blowing around in your garden and it will get everything. Um, you also want to avoid wetting leaves. Um, so do not use an overhead sprinkler. Um, and I know that's gonna be sad for everybody um, who uses overhead sprinklers in order to cut their time, but then you're wetting the leaves and you're inviting the disease in. Um, you also want to space your plants and um, thin out. So if you've got like a whole big tight conglomeration of leaves, um, chances are those are going to get diseased because there's no airflow in there. So it, even if you have to sacrifice like a whole stem in order to get that out, in order to create a little bit more space in your plant, um, via the you know pictures that I'm showing you, I'm not like make it a skeleton. Don't do that, but to, but to create a little bit more airspace would be good. And then you can use fungicides like copper for organic gardeners. Um, and then there's some suggestions in the other um, UW pamphlets for non-organic methods. Um, the what's what what other University extensions are showing, and also I've seen this with other plants is, and what I have been testing out over the last couple of years is using neem oil. Um, so um, I will just put that out there if anybody wants to have a conversation with me on the side, offline on that one, um, I'm happy to share that. So, and then that rotation, um, you know, that rotation is important because if those diseases are in your soil, it's, um, you know, that's, that's already a tough one. Okay, and then choose to re disease resistant varieties. So you'll see that when you're choosing your seeds and or plants, you know, in your seed catalog, it'll show you, well, their um, resistance to early blight or late blight or septoria leaf spot. And, and so if it's a, a real issue for you, um, any particular disease, then maybe you want to choose varieties that have some resistance. So, so here is um, on the right hand side, um, we have what I would identify as septoria. 
Okay, these are all in my garden. Okay, I don't have a perfect garden. Um, nobody does. The second, the middle one um, might be early blight because of the angular, okay? And um, I don't think you necessarily really know unless you're a horticulturalist or somebody puts this under the microscope and tells you. Um, but it doesn't matter because the, um, what you do is exactly the same. Get the leaves off your plants and get them out of the garden. So, so here I've got um, Jasper cherry. And this is, I found this really interesting. I've never had an issue with Jasper cherry before. Um, but you can see in that red ring on the left-hand side there, well, Jasper cherry has got all kinds of yellow leaves on it. All right? Nobody else did. <laughs> um, and it has resistance to late blight and early blight. So, um, you know, it doesn't mean it's resistance. It doesn't mean it's, um, you're just not going to get it because the plants will get disease. Every plant will get disease. So common other tomato issues that you might have, blossom and rot, um, that's where the, the end gets black. And it's actually caused by um, cal uneven, uneven calcium distribution in the plant. But really what causes that uneven calcium distribution is the fact that it's uneven watering. So if that plant was like watered a whole lot and then you, know, you didn't water it for, I don't know, a couple of weeks or whatever, or it doesn't have like even watering, you may end up with that. It doesn't, it, you can fix that problem by just starting to water evenly. It's just that all the next tomatoes will be good. It's the ones that have got that, that um, black leathery bottom, it, that's not gonna change. Okay, another thing you'll see is cat facing. I see this more on heirloom tomatoes and it just is. <laughs> um, it says caused by cool temperatures when young. I, you know, it's been pretty warm. That cat face is in my garden right now. Um, and then crackling, I also see this cracking if there is a lot of rain and there is moisture sitting on the tops of the tomatoes. And so like rain accumulates around that stem and then it will kind of get black because, um, you know, water is accumulated there and it just kind of degrades that. So humidity is, is high humidity in really hot weather times and in really cool weather times is not your friend. And, and we've had some of that. And I, I almost feel like we should have had more disease um, than we have now, or I should have had more disease and I haven't. Okay, the, the next thing that um, is that we have around here is late blight. Um, and, and I have to say, I've had this probably two years I've had late blight. And, and so you end up with these spots on your tomatoes and um, and on the leaves, you can see that this literally, in seven to 10 days, your plants will be decimated. My, um, and I have tried in a lot of different ways to, um, to like save tomatoes and all that. It's, it's systemic, it's in the, it's in the plant. Um, my suggestion is once your plant has this, get it out of your garden so it doesn't pass on to other plants and dispose of it. Okay, so some common pests. This little guy, he's not so little. Um, this dude is probably about five, six inches, four to, four to five inches long. Um, and you'll know you have tobacco hornworm when you see that hornworm damage um, up in the upper left-hand corner. You will just basically see sticks and tomatoes partially eaten. That is the tobacco hornworm. And um, it starts as that beautiful moth. It's a huge moth. Um, and, and you might see those like flying around. And you're like, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, until <laughs> it becomes a tobacco hornworm on your plant. And so like, you know, the whole idea is that you go out, observe your plants. You know, if, if the plant is out there and you haven't looked at it in four days or three or four days, stuff is happening. Um, so tomato plants do, you know, they need a stroll by. And so if you see, um, you know, this, this issue with um, the leaves stripped off, 
you know you've got a tobacco hornworm. Um, the, the thing that is confounding with these is that when it's light, they are absolutely stationary still. And when it's dark, that's when they start moving and eating. And you can like literally do, if you like have one of these, like in, um, like in a box, you can like put the flashlight on and it stops and you put it in the dark and it starts moving. It's kind of cool. But um, even my chickens won't eat these. <laughs> They're just disgusting. But um, pick them off. Find them and pick them off. It's like, where's Waldo? It's, it's great, except when you can't find them. So what's kind of cool is that the community garden, um, so these are parasitic wasps up in the right-hand corner that have laid um, eggs and hatching those eggs on that tobacco hornworm, and they use it for food. So that means you have a healthy organic garden because you've got parasitic wasps in there that are taking care of the things that are um, taking out your um, tomato plants. Okay, so again, the secret sauce is there will be disease and pests, guarantee it. So the idea is to observe and act as soon as possible by putting down mulch, watching your watering, um, checking for, for disease, checking for, um, for tobacco hornworms. Um, you know, the, the, the truth is, is that everything eventually dies. The goal is to harvest as many tomatoes as possible off those plants before, um, before the end. And Debbie asks, is it too late to prune the lower branches up to that 10, 12 inches mark? No, no, it's not too late to prune. Um, so what, what you have to decide, and you don't have to take the stems off that have already there so that you're removing tomatoes probably at this point, just remove the leaves. So all you're doing is you're cutting those leaves off. So this is my little kit that I use for pruning, okay? So I have one of these. This is my tool. I walk around with this in my garden all the time, okay? So I'm just taking and I'm clipping off those lower leaves. You don't have to clip off the stems, lower leaves, okay, to, to bring it up that high. And then I have my little, you know, X yogurt container and my jute twine and a little pair of scissors. And so then I just like pull this out. And so if I see something that needs tying up, then, you know, this makes it all like a little tidy package for me. So um, this is leaves of black crim um, planted in different beds are curling and drying. Sometimes watering helps. Any idea what the issue could be if leaves are just curling and drying? Yeah, um, are they drying up and turning um, brown and falling off. That could be disease and so I would um, remove those if they're coming up from the bottom. Most of these diseases, they're basically from the bottom going up um, and then be consistent with your watering. So I, I would check the water, you know, get your hand down into the soil, three, four, you know, inches, maybe dig a little, little hole and, you know, if, if you can't get your hand into the soil, um, and check to make sure that your soil, you know, you don't want a really wet soil. And, and ideally, it's not gonna like totally dry out every, every single time um, before you water, but you don't want it soggy all the time either. So um, I have seen some like gray, and, and I don't know if they call it gray mold, um, but you know, browning of leaves, but if it's get those off, if it's all the whole plant, then um, there is a disease that's in the soil that's um, fusarium wilt, and but you would probably already have seen your whole plant collapse with that. Okay, what about ground up eggshells sprinkled in the soil? Do you think that would help with calcium? Okay, so um, this is my exp my experiences, and I and I've seen that. Um, with putting, you know, crushing eggshell and putting it down in, into the hole, you know, for, for additional calcium. 
okay, we have like some 35, 40 chickens. And so we have eggshells that go into our compost. And I will tell you that a year later, when I'm pulling compost out, I will see eggshell, okay? So the ability for eggshell to break down in that time period, I think is negligible. So another thing that you could use is bone meal. Um, however, the other thing that you need to be cautious with, I've, I've used bone meal um, in a place that was open and I've had a neighbor's dog come and dig up my plant. So, um, you know, just be aware of, of what you're using. I, I think um, if you have good compost, enough compost, and you do any water um, in a proper way, I, I, I don't think you're gonna have a problem with the blossom end rot. Okay. Oh, one other thing with that though, is that you, if you are having that problem, you wanna check the pH of your soil because, um, if your soil pH is off, you're, you're not, the, the calcium in the soil is not gonna be able to be up taken into your plant. So if you are having blossom end rot problem um, and calcium doesn't seem to be helping, check the pH of your soil, do a pH, do a, um, a soil test and send it into the, to the extension. If you save seeds, um, they may not be disease resistant, is that correct? So they, nothing is, um, so let me put it this way. If you're going to save seeds, um, what you want to do is you want to take your first tomato when your plant is, doesn't have, hopefully doesn't have disease. So that, that would be the first thing. The second is um, you can use, and if you want to, you can look this up or, or Google it. So a friend of mine uses a bleach solution on the seeds after saving, saving the seeds um, in order to make sure that there's not, you know, disease being carried with those seeds. Um, I don't do that, um, and I don't perceive that I've had a problem, um, but I'm not saving tomato seeds off of plants that are sick, okay? Um, so this is, this is how I'm seed saving. So I have my tomato right here, and I've got my little dish, and so I'm just squeezing out the, the seeds and the pulp from this into my dish, and I'll so, show this to you in just a second and I'm making a mess. Um, and so here's my seeds yeah. and there's like tomato juice in there. I'll add a little water to this and then I just kind of cover it with one of these things or any other pla you know, plastic lid or whatever in order to keep the fruit flies down. I don't know where fruit flies come from, but I have to say, I just cut this tomato open and then there was a fruit fly here. Where do they come from? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I never saw any fruit flies in my house before this. Um, so I will just put this on my counter for two or three days and it might even just get a little moldy on the top. But what you're basically doing is it's going to break down that like gel that's around the seed. And, um, and then, so after three or four days and it looks like it's kind of broke down, I just take my tea um, strainer and I pour this into here so I've got the seeds and then I rinse them in water and I just make sure all the, the gunk is off of them. And then I will take them and just put them out on a plate, okay, to dry. And once they're totally dry, you, you need to make sure they're really, really dry. Then I will um, package them in little plastic bags and label them with the variety and the year that I saved them. All right, well, thank you all so much. Happy gardening. Yeah, have a good night.